my heart can sing when I pause to remember that heartache here is but a stepping stone along a trail that's winding always upward this troubled world well it's not my final but until then my heart will go on singing until Cause our hearts to tremble Remembered there Will only bring a smile But until then My heart will go on singing Until then With joy we'll journey toil and struggle may take its toll of misery and strife but the soul of man is like a waiting falcon when it's released it's destined for the but until then, my heart will go on singing, until then, with joy I'll journey on, until the day my eyes behold the Savior, until the day God comes. unworthy <clears throat> you know I'm going up there to heaven and like the little course we taught the kids on the gospel train <clears throat> I need no fare I'm riding on a pass it's the blood for sinners slain and you and I are not worthy of the least of God's blessings and yet he has given us the best that there is crown jewel of heaven, Jesus himself. Unworthy am I of the grace that he gave. Unworthy to hold to his hand. I'm amazed that a king would reach down to a slave. This love I cannot understand Unworthy, unworthy In bondage un And all alone I missed the word 
Sir, let's do that line again. Unworthy, unworthy a beggar in bondage and alone, but he made me worthy, and now by his grace, his mercy has made me his own. My sorrows and sickness laid stripes on his back. My sins caused the blood that was shed. My faults and my failures have woven a crown of thorns that he wore on his head. Unworthy Just redeem yourself. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm a child of the King. His royal blood now flows through my veins. And I, who was wretched, poor now can sing. Praise God. Praise God. I'm a child of the King. 
praise the Lord. Okay. Let's go back to the book of James, chapter 4. We're going to do our Easter message. From whence come wars and fightings among you? <laughs> oh, my. For you visitors, uh, we barbecued the Easter bunny right after we had the funeral of old lady Luck and killed off Santa Claus. So just in case you're wondering, if you came for an Easter egg roll, forget it. If you want to hear the Easter message, it'll probably be in July or somewhere. Uh, we will have it, but we certainly don't want to uh, have it at the time of the Feast of Ishtar. Asterisk, that's what this is, you know. All the churches are obediently gathering for the Feast of Ishtar. Ishtar. He said, well, I thought that was a, a Babylonian goddess. It is. All the customs around Easter are pagan and demonic, and you pay due to, you pay homage to the demon gods that are behind it when you celebrate with the Easter baskets, Easter eggs, and all the rest. Now, if you like candy, you might buy their eggs after the, uh, when they mark them down. After they eat them, I don't think they'll choke on you. And you won't be celebrating their feast anyway. My, didn't we have a good, Workshop. The afterglow continues. Praise the Lord. If you're visiting, you didn't get in on the workshop, pick up the tapes. They're tremendous. And um, we have, uh, I want you to continue to pray about new booklets that are on the assembly line coming together very rapidly. A new songbook is coming out. Peg, which sings all the the choruses we use. People are asking about that. It's almost ready to go, and it'll be in one book this time. Make it a lot handier. And um, there's a booklet coming out on uh, this dodging the sex hooks. It's almost ready to roll. The let's see what else is going along. Uh, the book on shame is coming. It's almost ready to go, and slothfulness is being assembled, and uh, diabetes is on the on the assembly line. So we've got a lot of things coming along. Chug along. We'd be, be praying because these these messages the Lord has shown us are going everywhere, and uh, as soon as we get enough booklets out again, we'll publish the eleventh book big book with all these booklets in, involved in there. Uh, even got a title for it, Harassing the Host of Hell. And uh, isn't that what we're doing? Amen. Well, we've battled them. We've annihilated them. We've demolished them. We've conquered them. Uh, we've done everything else. We might as well harass them for a while. Huh? And so praise the Lord. Let's go to chapter 4 of James. <clears throat> sure glad for that testimony of Scott and Dwayne. They won't need this particular verse now. Wars and fightings. <laughs> All right. From whence come wars and fightings among you? From my wife, from my husband, from my preacher. My teacher, my, my boss at work, that's where it comes from, right? Wrong. Where do the wars and fightings come from? They come even of your lust, your strong desires that are at war in your members. The reason so, so many people are so hard to get along with and so irritable and crossways all the time and always they're, always, they're, they're a disaster going somewhere to happen. And uh, the reason for that is because they're at war inside. They're totally disconnumerated inside. They found no real contentment. They can, they can quote Bible verses. They can string out lovely mottos, and they can even tell other people how to get help. And yet, if they haven't partaken of this themselves, they remain discontented, miserable inside, and they go everywhere causing irritation. And everybody's glad when they go. They're glad when they're not there. 
Because peace and quiet's there when they're not there. And when they walk in the door, it's storm. It's irritation. It's upset. It's blah, 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 blah. Picky, picky, picky. Always nitpicking. Well, if you're like that, listen on. The wars and fightings that you think are, other people are causing are home-based. They're inside you. That's why you're having such a hard time. Because as long as you hang it on everybody else and blame everybody else for the trouble that you're having, then you're never going to solve anything. See, it's another case of the buck passing. It's another case of denial, spirit of denial, where I refuse to admit there's anything wrong with me. And even if somebody corners them and pins them to the wall and said, now there, you have to admit it. I saw you did it. I saw you do it. And here's the evidence. And don't tell me you didn't do that. And I say, yes. All right. As soon as they walk out of the room, but it's not my fault. And they're never going to take responsibility for anything. There are some people who have no responsibility in life. Everything is somebody else's job. And they live trying to get other people to do their work and their, their task. You know, I guess I'm into slothfulness too much. I'm uh, writing slothfulness right now. And that reminds me that slothfulness constantly denies any responsibility for the miserable failures in the life. And it's just plain laziness. And it's also based on carnality. Don't forget this. The reason we're so easily snared by these things is because of our basic carnality. We are not spiritual. We are carnal. And he says, where do these fightings and wars come from among you? They come from your own strong desires. He said, you lust, you strong desire, and you don't have it. And you kill and you desire to have and you cannot obtain. You fight in war. You have not because you ask not. The first reason we don't have the things we need is, be, is a very simple one. We don't ask. Well, God knows I need it. Yeah, and everybody else that knows you knows you need it. But uh, that won't get it. There has to be a humility and admitting I have a real problem here. I am mean. I am hateful. I do nasty, hateful, stinking little things to cause other people misery. I deliberately snarl up things. I deliberately say things. I deliberately do things just to irritate other people. And I know what I'm doing when I do it. My what a rosy glow over the audience here. <laughs> Sound familiar? Well, there's a mean little boy spirit in there. There's a mean little girl spirit in there. And I mean a real tacky mean. Not just mean mean, but just tacky. That's determined to snarl up everything and mess up everything. And that's in there, and that's where the wars and fightings are coming from. And you, you, you desire, you want this, and so you don't have it, so you kill. And desire to have, you cannot obtain, you fight in war, you have not, because you ask not. There's a book going to hit the bookstore in next week or so. Don't buy it. You're not ready for it. I can look out and tell you're not ready for it. You will never be able to assimilate. So uh, we probably have to put those under the table, mic somewhere. Called Reese Howell, Intercessor. Oops, I didn't mean to tell you what it was. He only died in 1950. What a horrible person. He and his wife left their son here and went to the mission field. <laughs> you say, help, 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 help. Looks like he tripped onto something we hadn't even smelled of yet, huh? Wake up and smell the coffee. We haven't got any dedicated people to mount anything. We have left 
practically nothing. Well, what happened to that boy? He became a, a preacher on the mission field. How strange. How could that be? Your family. You have to take care of your family. 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 How could that mother go off and leave her child? She, was, uh, she got born again during the Welsh Revival. I guess that helped. Now, you don't read that book. I've given you all that you can stand, and you can tell that it wouldn't be a book you'd want to read, right? We've got a few more books coming in that you don't want to read either, but I'll mention them later. I got a whole string of them coming. We got one called Before We Kill and Eat You. But you wouldn't want to read that because that's a little strong for you. And then The Cross in Mozambique. You wouldn't want to read that either. Too strong. You have to grow a while before you can. You probably need uh, quite a few hours on the road down here first before you can handle that. Your little stomach would get all upset. Such dedication would throw you for a loop because it goes way beyond grabbing for money and grabbing for position and power, wanting to be the top, top banana and top dog. We've got a ways to go, people. And we haven't got long to get ready for the grand deluge of the end times that's coming. The tides are washing in now. Have you noticed what a tremendous disaster this flooding of Chicago has caused? Did it bring home to you just how fragile our whole system is? A few terrorists with a few well-placed bombs could blow up everything, immobilize everything. Did you ever thought about that? You say, you're scaring me. Well, you better look at this verse over here then. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. You better get where you learn how to use it. This little playing church and Easter rabbit is not going to get it. You can trot out all the Easter bunnies you want, and they're not going to stop the enemy. One of my favorite cartoons is where a lady goes to the door, and there's a great humongous monster at the door, about nine feet tall with long fangs and everything. And uh, she, her eyes are out on stems, and her husband's back in the house, and she says, Quick, Henry, dial a prayer. I tell you, people, we're going to have to get beyond this stage. We're going to have to get beyond playing tiddlywinks. We're going to have to get beyond uh, collecting little things. We're going to have to get our, our minds on the main line. The main thing is to get the word out. The main thing is to get, the, get, get our lives changed and radically made over. When you get that on the top burner... But as long as your mind is on other things and as long as your main thing is to entertain yourself and to have fun, 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 fun. I'm not having any fun. Well, try spending an hour on your knees with the Lord and see how that helps. Well, that's no fun. That's right. It's work. Slothfulness is coming. You are acquainted with him. He's already got you. We have to watch out that we don't just use our lives up, burn our lives up for nothing. You're burning up daylight for nothing. Well, he says, um, you ask and, uh, well, he said, the first reason you don't have, you're fighting war, you're battling all the time, you're scrambling, you're trying to pressure people, manipulate people, you're trying to do nasty things to, to get back at them, you're doing this and you're doing that, and you fight and you war, and yet you still don't have what you're seeking for. Some women want their husband to spend more time with them. And so they nag the daylights out of them, and the husband runs as far as he can get the other way. Because uh, you're doing exactly the wrong thing, sis. 
Well, I don't know what to do. Get in the prayer closet. And zip your lip. And start doing what you're supposed to do. You'd be surprised how quickly hubby will take notice. It'll be such a radical change, he'd probably first think that, that he's moved into a new time frame or something. When he comes in from work, he's tired, he doesn't want to talk. Don't hit him with all the, don't wrap all the kids' troubles around his head when he walks through the door. Well, you better do this, and you better do that, and I'm glad you're home because I'm tired, and I'm worn, and I'm frazzled. Now, if you were smart, you'd do what Jesus did. When he had a little spanking to administer, a little problem to solve, he had fish on the coals, and when they came in hungry and tired, and he didn't even talk to them until after they'd eaten. Some of you look at me. What's he talking about? I never heard such things. Well, get out of the feminist movement and you'll learn a few things. Get into the Bible. Get into the Proverbs and learn what you're to do. If you'll do what God says, it will work. If you don't do what God says, that also will work. But it'll work the wrong way. You say, boy, you sure got it in for the women this morning. Oh, not yet. Wait till I get my whole sermon on that. You're not going to get these men moving unless the power of God comes on them. They're not going to have time for the power of God if they're busy fighting you and dodging you. And if you're whining and whining and belly aching, I know some people, their husband's home and they can't stand him. He goes away to work somewhere for a month. They're screaming and hollering. I'm all lonesome. I'm lonesome. I think you deserve it. You can't be satisfied. You're not satisfied if he's home. You're not satisfied if he's away. What's the matter with you? You need to get your heart right with God. And you need to get praying because you're going to pull, you're going to pull your man out of God's gear if you're not careful. Well, he ought to be strong enough to do it. Listen. You know what the Bible says about the nagging woman? I don't know why we turned over to here. Sure is rich territory that I think we'll dig a little deeper. Over in the Proverbs, I can't give it to you, but you can look it up. You will because you're going to see, I don't believe it says that, but it does. It says that living in the house with a contentious woman is like living with a drip a leak in the roof. You say, well, that, that sounds strange. Until you realize they had sod houses, and when it came a heavy soaking rain, the sod soaked through, and then for weeks it dripped. Drip, drip, drip. Did you ever live in a house with drips? Well, around here at the church, every once in a while, you better dodge a bucket. You know, we develop some occasionally, and they just drip, drip, drip. It's a continual dripping. Chinese water torture, drip, drip, drip. He said, well, I finally got him to do it. Yes, you did, but you paid a tremendous price for it, sister. He despised you for it. And he's less interested now. He'll grow less and less interested. You can kill him off. Just watch it. Lord, I don't know why we're coming down this trail. What's, why don't you mean women come this morning? I'll declare. All right. You fight in war. You have not. First of all, because you don't ask. You don't ask because I'll take care of it. I'll do it myself. And so you start about being the mean little stink, trying to get what you want, and that doesn't work. You try being the mean big stink, and that doesn't work. And everything you're trying is backfiring. Now you say, that's not true of me. I've been praying, I've been asking and asking, and God just doesn't hear my prayers. Yes, he does. He hears them. Sometimes he says, 
Yes. Oh, I like those kind, don't you? Sometimes he says, no, I don't like that one. Sometimes he says, later, I don't like that one too much either. And sometimes he can't even consider our request because, notice what it says, because you ask amiss or astray, you ask an error that you may consume it on your own lust. Why do you want this to happen? So Jesus can be magnified, baloney, so I can be happy, so I can be contented, so I can go where I want to, so I can have what I want, so I can have the money I want to spend, so I can go and visit what I want to do, I can go and have a high heel time. That's why I really want it. Lord, give me this. Never occurred to you to ask for something that would make you a more devout Christian, did it? It's no wonder you don't get any answers. You're asking them, and it's insulting. You're insulting God's intelligence. You, you run it by me, and I'm not very smart. You say, that's right, watch it. But uh, I'm not real smart, but I could figure out that you had nothing, no interest except your own. You're interested in taking care of yourself. Why do you want to get well when you're sick? Well, so I can go and do the things I like to do. I don't get to, and I don't feel good. Well, whoopee-doo, did you know God doesn't heal people so they feel good? Did you know he doesn't feel, heal people so they can go do their own thing? God heals people so they can serve Jesus. Well, I serve Jesus. I'm at church every time the door opens. Well, three gold stars for you. Oh, some of you missed. You didn't get even, well, two gold stars a month. How's that? Some people out of 12 services, they make one, they make two to three. They just barely touch base here, and there's no earthly way they can know what's going on at this church. No way. And those that miss the most have the least reasons to actually do it. We have three services a week because we think you need to be in every one of them. And if you break the continuity, you're not going to be in the main swing of things. I don't care how well you talk. It won't work. Well, at any rate, you have, you ask, but you ask astray. You ask greedy things for yourself. You're not interested in the things that the Lord's interested in. You ask for things that have nothing to do with the advancement of the Lord's kingdom. You know, you ought to ask for enough strength to do what he wants you to do. That's what I'm doing. I get letters begging me to come overseas. And I sit and cry over them because I can't go. But there's going to be some help come forthcoming. But what I can do, I'm doing to the max, believe me. I'll just tell you this. People are always asking, how do you feel? I'm not up to par. One of the first signs you'll see that I'm up to par is when I show up on Saturday night for the men's prayer meeting. One of the hardest things for me to do is to skip the men's prayer meeting. This church was conceived and born in the white-hot heat of a men's prayer meeting. Thank God for our men that keep it going. If you show up and I'm not here, you mark it down. If I were, could be here, I would. The reason I stopped coming was because if I went to men's prayer meeting, I was so tired the next morning, I could not function like I should. So I stay home and I pray for the guys who are here. I'm not complaining. I'm glad I have enough strength to do what I'm supposed to do. And I hope you'll keep praying for me to do that. It doesn't matter. It's far more important at this moment, evidently, for me to be home on the computer because uh, there's some marvelous material that God has given us to work with, and it's coming out in printed form. And perhaps someday that'll change. I don't know. 
If it does, okay. If it doesn't, okay. I've learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You might try that on for size. My delight in life is to be able to turn out that material. That's what I can do. I can come here and preach, which I love to do. I can come uh, to a workshop, and sometimes I even get an extra burst of energy during the workshop. Now, if you wonder what that is talking about, I'm not going to tell you if you weren't here. Too bad. I think they caught it on videotape, but they erased it, didn't they, Dan? Dan, you didn't erase it? <gasps> I want that master tape. He's shaking his head at me, defying me. Said the tapes belong to the church. I can't get them. Well, anyway, are you doing to your max what God wants you to do? You've got a job, but you have a that job is to make expenses so you can serve Jesus. I believe it was William Carey, I always remember, a Scotsman. Um, he was a shoe cobbler years ago. And he, somebody said, I understand that you are a shoe cobbler to make your living, uh, uh, that you do shoe cobbling, that's your job. He said, no, my job is being a Christian. I cobble shoes to make expenses. So if you start looking at your job as a, a way to make expenses so you're free to do what God wants you to do, you'll start moving in a new dimension. By the way, he was the father of the modern missionary movement. He raised all kinds of money to send people to the missionary fields, and I believe he finally went himself. We'll get his biography here. We, we got some biographies of famous people coming in to the book room. And they'll, uh, it's terrible to read those things because they make you want to crawl under the floor and hide when you begin to read about men and women who really sacrificed. And remember this, these people did not have access to binding and loosing. And yet they shook the whole world. God has put in our hands in this generation the truth of binding and loosing, which gives extra power to prayer. Can you imagine what why the devil is fighting so hard to keep a generation of fighters from laying hold on this powerful weapon. Others have done mighty works, not even knowing about binding and loosing. But in this generation, as we're coming into the tango with the Antichrist, God has resurrected the binding and loosing so that we will have even greater power over the enemy. Instead of that, we seem to be sliding along. It depends on where you want to go. All right. You ask and you ask amiss so that you can enjoy it for yourself. There's some people that's the only thing they ever ask about. They ask for themselves and they ask amiss. Now look what he says in verse 4. You adulterers and adulteresses. <gasps> nasty, nasty. He speaks rather plainly, doesn't he? You know what that is? That's He's talking about spiritual adultery. You are a spiritual adulterer. You are a spiritual adulteress because your interest, your love, your desires lay all in the carnal area. Remember those things that were earthly, sensual, and demonic? That's the only thing you're interested in. And the carnal person, that's all they're really interested in. They get wrapped up in those things, can't see the Lord for anything, and they're going to get around to the Lord one day, maybe. But he says when you are busy asking for things, working for things, seeking for things, to consume it on yourself, then he says, you are adulterers and adulteresses. You're guilty of spiritual adultery. No, you're not. That the friendship of the world is enmity, open warfare with God. Whosoever, therefore, will be a friend of the world is an 
enemy of God. You want to be a friend of the world? You want to go where the world goes? You want to get your entertainment like the world does? You want to see all the things the world sees? You want to uh, partake of everything the world takes? Is that your appetites? That's where your appetites lie? Congratulations, you just drew the Enmity Award. You're at war with God because friendship with the world is open war with God. Do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy? Now that's not the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does not lust to envy. But evil spirits do. The spirit in us that loves the world, loves the things of the world, that's the one that is lusting to envy. And envy is one thing that fuels this carnality. Well, she has one, I want one too. He got one, I'm, I've got to have one too. And we just keep on climbing, trying to find, be, have everything everybody else has. But he giveth more grace in spite of this awful reality that the evil spirit is lusting to envy. He gives more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resists the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. A lot of people are very proud. They won't admit there's anything wrong with them. They're never wrong. They've never been wrong in their life. Just ask them. And... Uh, if you're like that, you're never wrong. And no matter what anybody says, no, that's not the way it is. Then uh, God is resisting you. That's where you're hitting so much resistance. God is resisting the proud. He gives his grace to the humble, the people who are willing to take the back seat, the willing to face facts about themselves. Some people never face the fact of how bad off they are. I know you never met anybody like that, but you might look inside, you might find that's where that person lives, right in there. The person who can never bear to admit they're wrong. Perfectionists do this. Perfectionists make everyone, they make themselves miserable because they're not perfect and they're always trying to be. And then they make everybody around them miserable because they try to require perfection of them. Now, it's good to do the best you can. But perfectionists make themselves absolutely miserable and, and stupid. They make themselves just out to be an absolute idiot. Because they're constantly, they cannot allow anything less than perfection. So they're miserable themselves because what they do is not perfect. And certainly uh, they're much better than other people. So other people are really down in the tube. So they look down on everybody else. The perfectionist mars himself or herself and everybody around them. If you're a perfectionist, get rid of that spirit. Be willing to do what you can. Do the best you can at what you're doing. Because God gives grace to the humble, the ones who recognize they can't do everything. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit. I don't like submitting. That's right. That's rebellion. The other name for that, the opposite of submit is rebel. But he says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, the solution for having all this uproar in yourself, and you notice he's, de he's, he's dealing with us inside. He's not dealing with the world around us. He's dealing with the, the storm we create in ourselves. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. A lot of people say, boy, I'm resisting the devil, but he's sure not fleeing. Well, you missed a step. Until you submit yourself to the Lord, he's not going to flee from you. You can resist all you want to, and he's not going to flee. The devil will not flee when you're not 
first submitted to God. If you don't know how to submit to God, go to Romans 12, 1 and 2 and learn a lesson about submission to God. God is not going to pour his power into people who will waste it, who will hoard it, and use it for themselves. Some people are so stingy, they hoard everything they have. They, they hoard everything to themselves. I tried to do that with all my good sermons, and I found these preacher boys around here stealing all my good sermons. Then I found out the King James Bible wasn't copyrighted. Anyone can go to the Word of God and find them. Submit yourselves to God. That's an absolute essential. Some people, in spite of all their trying, have never really submitted themselves to God. There's that proud arrogant makes them think they're better than other races, makes them think they're smarter than other people, even though it's very obvious they're not. Uh, there are a lot of people smarter than they are. One of them that's smarter than they are is the one that submits to the Lord. That's being smart. Submit yourselves to God and then you resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Some people have a high estimation. They think because they know a lot of Bible verses, they're going to win. It's an attitude of mind. You can take a baby Christian who only knows three or four verses. <clears throat> if they submit to the Lord wholeheartedly and use those three verses, the devil, he'll, they'll throw a kink in the devil's thing. And somebody else that knows 150 verses, who's not submitted, who's saying, look at me, I am superior Christian number one. And watch me hit them, hit them, hit them. And it'll just, nothing will happen because. And they'll say, oh, but my prayers were answered. It's doubtful. If you didn't submit first, your prayers are not answered. I don't care what you, what you, which angle you come at. You're going to have to get the things in order. The submission to the Lord, putting him first in your life, is going to have to be the first thing. As long as your life is completely absorbed with everything else, don't expect the Lord to move in mighty power. He's not going to do it. What's the main goal in your life? Is it to get uh, to reach out and minister to others, to pray, to witness? Is the main thing to get the word out? To use every opportunity that you have at your fingertips to help get things out? Everybody doesn't have the same opportunity. But are you using the opportunities you have? God is not going to give you other opportunities to use the ones you have. And some people have never used the ones that are at hand. They have grandiose notions about doing this and that and the other, but they're not willing to start off and do the small things God's asking them to do. So you're willing to do the little, you'll never do the big. Just mark that down. And I mean, until you're willing to do the little with joy and thanksgiving, well, why do I have to do these little menial things? Anybody can do this. Well, that's why you're doing them, because you're not capable of doing anything else. Because you've got some pride to grind away so that you'll be happy doing just because it's something the Lord gave you to do. Not because it's great in the sight of man, but because it's... And if you, if you have a lot of pride, you're going you're gonna to run up a real stump trying to serve the Lord. That pride has got to go. And you can hide it, you can cloak it, and you can look down your nose at other people and think you're better than they are. And I got news for you. You're never going to walk with Jesus very far. Don't fool yourself that other people don't know when you're arrogant and when you're standoffish. You can smile and all you want to and say how to do all you want to, and they sense that stiff arm you're giving them. You just can't fake this business of really being genuine. Some people try. They try and try. You say, well, who are you talking to? I don't know. If it's you, the shoe fits, wear it. If it pinches, either uh, cut off part of your foot or something. Adjust to the situation. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. 
Well, that seems awfully simple, doesn't it? You get close to God, and he'll get close to you. How about that? You say, well, I want God to come over here. He's not moving. He's where he's always been. We're off track. He's not. When you move toward God, you're getting on track, and he's very near to you. Cleanse your hands. That's what you do, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Clean up your act on the outside. What you do is represented by your hands. And then clean up your heart. You double-minded. That's schizophrenic. Schizophrenic means there's a um, psychological lingo for split personality. And uh, you have to realize that when you've got that thing, a lot of times... If you've given in to it over the years, it will fool you. I've told you before, having a split personality is having uh, Mr. Nice Guy on this side and Mr. Rock on this side. And so Mr. Nice Guy can be just talking along to somebody and suddenly Mr. Nasty turns around and said, Shut your mouth, I hate you. And he said, what did you say? I didn't say anything. Yes, you did. I heard you. No, I didn't say anything. What's the matter with you? And he's telling the truth. He didn't hear it. And then Mr. Nasty turned around and said, shut your mouth. That's what I said. <laughs> and he says, see, you did it again. Did what? There must be something wrong with your mind. I didn't say anything. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. Mr. Nice said, shut your mouth. I told you that two, three times already. Here we are back to Mr. Nice again. And that's why, oh, uh, it can be Miss, Miss or Mrs. Nice and Nasty too. <laughs> I presume you knew that. I didn't want you to go away and have your husband tell your husband. You heard what the preacher said, didn't you? <laughs> cleanse your hands you sinners purify your hearts you double minded you don't have to go to see it's heart trouble when you have double mindedness it's heart trouble and it will have to be done dealt with in deliverance because that double mindedness will cause you to be a nasty critter it'll also have that little tacky, nasty little child, childish. It makes people do childish, nasty things, things that are just ignorant. You'd, act, you'd expect some little brat child to do, a grown-up person, and yet they'll do that and then look like a tree full of owls when you confront them. They'll say, oh, what do you mean? I didn't do anything. And even when they know they did, they'll lie. So they have lying problems too. I say they because I know it's not you. Or is it? Check up. If you're going to be used of God, and I hope you want to be. Up behind me, the scripture says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. If you've never asked Jesus to come in your heart or you're not sure you have, wouldn't you like to today? He's standing outside the door, and he's asking you again. If you've never got to ask him in your heart, wouldn't you like to do it now? If you've already asked him, uh, but you're not still not sure of what, what's happened, come up front and say, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. You probably need Bible verses. If you've really done it, you need the Scripture to undergird your decision. If that's not your problem, but you're driven, harassed, and tormented, this is producing compulsive behavior, slowing down, stopping, or reversing spiritual growth and progress. This is the work of demons, and they must be cast out in Jesus' name. Over here, these signs shall follow them that believe in my name, so they cast out devils, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. This is the New Testament program. And if you need deliverance from evil spirits, Jesus Christ died on the cross poured out his blood, and then he rose in glorious resurrection to guarantee salvation in his name, deliverance in his name, healing in his name, and the working of the gifts in his name. 